Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello again, everybody, and thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, Art and I are with the famous brain whisperer, Steve Campbell. Steve, good to see you again. Good to see you. Good to see you, John. How are you? Good. Hi, Steve. Good to see you too, Art. How are you? Hey. Well, you know something? I've been waiting to have this conversation today because I've been wanting to say this for a long time. In a perfect world, mm -hmm. Well, that's the lead in. Because the world is not perfect, is it? No. The world is broken. We're living in a broken world. And if there's anything the pandemic has shown to the world is its own vulnerability. Everyone is feeling so very vulnerable because they're seeing that their life just isn't as secure as they thought it would be. So we live not only in an imperfect world, we're broken people. And none of us says everything that's positive. In fact, studies have shown, starting with Shad Helmstetter's book way back in the 1980s, that most of what we say to ourselves is negative stuff. I used to think I was the only one who felt bad about himself. It turns out I'm not. In fact, as you study this, you find that there's a basic security in the world. So how do you not only live with those imperfections, because everyone has them, but what I talk about in my seminars is how you can embrace them. So let's talk about that a little bit, because the information I want to share with you is so exciting. It's only been coming onto the foreground recently, back in the 1960s. It started with a little book called The Guide to Rational Living, written by Dr. Albert Ellis and Dr. Bob Sherman. It's still in print. You can get it on Amazon. There's another wonderful book called What You Say When You Talk to Yourself. That's by Shad Helmstetter. And they talk about our self-images. So before we get into that, let's talk about two wonderful characteristics which our brain were created for that help us deal with our own imperfections. One is this. And I say it really slowly. Your brain believes everything you tell it about yourself, about the world, about everything. That's scary. And that's wonderful. Why is it scary? Because as I said a few minutes ago, most of what we say to ourselves is negative stuff. So when we say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that. I'm so stupid. Your brain says, oh, okay. Yeah, you are. And the scary part is you keep saying that to ourself, which we all do when we mess up. Your brain not only believes you, it begins rewiring itself. This is called neuroplasticity. And those messages not only become a part of your mindset over time, when you keep saying it, they become a part of who you are. That's the scary part. But there's a wonderful part. The wonderful part is when you mess up and you say, you know what, that really was dumb, but that doesn't mean I'm dumb. That really was a failure, but that doesn't mean I'm a failure. What does your brain say to that? Oh, okay. Now, here's what's even more exciting. Your brain doesn't care whether what you're saying is true or not. It never asks that question. The book that I always refer to when I talk about that with students is Phantoms in the Brain by Dr. V. S. Ramachandran out of UC San Diego. Phantoms refer to phantom limbs that have been amputated. And the patient may go into a doctor's office and say, you got to help me. I can't do a thing with my arm. And the doctor say, will say, well, that could be because I cut off that arm six months ago. And the patient says, you didn't tell my brain that. So the brain doesn't care whether what you're saying is true or not. Now, let's talk about embracing our own imperfections. Our imperfections come, ready, from our self-images. Notice I didn't say self-image. I said self-image as. We have thousands of self-images. I'm 73, and I've developed thousands of self-images in my life. How I see myself. 
as a husband, as a grandfather, as a speaker, as a writer, as a musician, all of these self-images I've created. Now, here's some things we need to remember, and then we're going to bring this all together and help you deal with your own imperfections. Your self-images are learned. You were not born with them. Now, I want to be very careful with this. You were naturally born with certain natural dispositions. I was born a natural teacher. I have always been a teacher. I had to learn the skill. I had to get my undergraduate degrees and teach in colleges for decades. But it's something I just do naturally. It's something that I absolutely love to do. Are you have this natural something, and John, you have this natural something. We all have this natural something that just comes about. When I was a kid, I used to put rocks in my backyard, pretending I was teaching them. So I'm a natural teacher, but it's something that I had to learn. So I have a very, very, very strong self-image with me as a teacher. Now, how are they learned? Our self-images, ready, are learned from what we say to ourselves about ourselves. Psychologists call this our self-talk. Our self-images are coming from what we're saying to ourselves about ourselves. They're not come from how we were raised. They're not coming from events in our lives. They come from what we say about how we were raised and what we say about events in our lives. So for the first 42 years of my life, I personally said to myself, I'm really stupid. I was so convinced, especially with math. I just could not understand numbers. I would see numbers, I would freak out. But in the 70s, I began tinkering around with computers. I thought, this is really fun. I'll take the motherboard out and I'll figure all this stuff. Eventually, I just went to graduate, went to graduate school, got a graduate education in um, information systems. I began teaching information systems at various universities. And then the dean came off and said, one of our math professors just quit, Steve, so you are our new math professor. Wait a minute, I can't teach math. He said, you want a job? Learn. There's the book. So I went to the library, picked up all the books I could in brain-based learning, and I began teaching math based on how the brain learns. And students began saying, oh, my gosh, you're such a wonderful math teacher. Here's what I began doing. I began replacing what I've been saying to myself for 42 years with math is really fun. Algebra is just a puzzle. You put X on this side and Y on this side, and you figure out what the number is. It's just a puzzle. It's a fun game. And I began teaching this way, and students began saying, my gosh, you're brilliant. And I ended up writing two college textbooks on what do you think? Math. Here's the point. That self-image of my being dumb in math came from what I was saying to myself about myself. When I was 42, I replaced those messages. And I began realizing I'm really smart with numbers. So here's the point. Our self-images are learned. They're coming, dear people, from what you are saying to yourself about yourself. What we now know about your brain is you can replace what you are saying. Now, give me an application, Steve. When is this most important to remember? It is most important to remember when you mess up. Because when all of us mess up, we often say, oh my gosh, how could I have been so stupid? And the brain pops up and says, oh, I know. Remember that dumb thing you did yesterday or the day before or the week before or the year before? And we almost get on the list. And we start going down the list of all the dumb things we've ever done. Now, this is really important. When you do that, your brain doesn't know that those memories happened a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. The brain's recording them again. But this time, if they happen when? Right now. And then you're carrying that stuff around. Here's what I want to share with your listeners. You don't have to do that anymore. So, how do you embrace your own perfections? Realize, number one, that we all have them. 
It doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean you're bad. It just means you have them. What do you do with them when you mess up? Number one, the list of all those imperfections, you throw that away. You don't need that in your life. That is a decision that you make. That's why they call this whole framework cognitive psychology. What do you do instead? Use three words when you mess up. And these words are what you say to yourself about yourself. Number one, you say, you know what? There's always a next time. The next time I can do it this way or that way or this way or that way. And the brain says, yes, you're absolutely right. So how many next times do we get? Number one, as many next times as we want. That is so exciting. Number two, when you say the next time, what you're also saying is, I will never give up. Ever. I will always try it again. In a different way. And the brain says, okay. But here's the last one. And this one is the most exciting for us of our. When you mess up and you look at your own imperfections, here's what you say. You say, you know what? I did mess up. But welcome to the world. In fact, when I mess up is when I learn the most. As you read the biographies of great American and and world leaders, it's amazing how many times they messed up. And yet they got up and they went on. Thomas Edison was asked how it felt to fail 999 times looking for the fulfillment of a light bulb. He said, I did not fail 999 times. I simply found 999 ways it didn't work. So how do you embrace your own imperfections? Number one, realize that they're neither bad nor good. They're just there. And what we can do is utilize them to become wiser, smarter, and have more abilities. And remember this, when you do that, What will your brain say? Oh, okay. Is what you're saying about yourself true? I don't even care. All I care about is what you tell me. But you say it, I believe it. You lock onto it, you know what I will do? I will do everything I can to make it true in your life. That's exciting. Steve, this is wonderful stuff. Thank you. But uh, let me see if I got this right. We have imperfections, but we should embrace them not to constantly repeat them, not to constantly believe them. Yes. We should embrace them and change our way of thinking by saying, yes, but. Yes, but. That's right. Yes, but. Mm -hmm. I did something stupid, but I'm not stupid. And I learned from it. And I'm going to learn from it. And I won't do it again. I'll do it differently next next time. time. That's right. Yep. Yep. And also, um, uh, you said you gave us an illustration of how uh, you knew that for the first 42 years of your life, you just sucked at math. Yeah. I mean, you knew it. You, I was you I was convinced. I was absolutely convinced. Now, yeah. when you and were a lot basic, of other people were too. To 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 paraphrase you, you were told learn math and teach it, or you're out of work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, in other words, that was a shock to the system. Yeah, that was a shock. That but was you, a shock. So, for people though who don't get that shock, but they wake up one morning and they say, uh, uh, "I want to be better in math." Okay, or mm-hmm. I don't want to suck in math. Whatever, mm-hmm. we'll try to keep it to the same thing. Uh, uh, I know that we have a whole uh, episode on affirmations, but can you give us just a short 
idea of this may not happen overnight. It may happen over a period of years. No, it did but, not but happen But what is a, pro what is a, yeah. a, a brief... I made a decision. Yeah, I made a decision that said, "Okay, I've got to teach math. How can I make it my own? How can I make it fun? Because that's basically the way I teach. Okay, how can I make fun?" So I began studying how the brain learns, and I began teaching so that math is not this big, huge, scary area. It's a series of puzzles, fun puzzles that you get to figure out how to solve. X is on this side, Y is on this side, X plus da da da, and it gets to be a really, really fun puzzle. And that applies to calculus, geometry, algebra, basic math. It's just rules that you that you use to solve puzzles, and it can be really fun. And your brain, instead of being really, really scared, it says, you know what? I'm having a good time with this. Let's do it some more. And what happens is, and this is where neuroplasticity comes in, the brain says, this is so much fun. I'm doing this. And the more I do it, the more fun it is. And yes, it's a challenge. And yes, it's hard. And yes, I got to figure out a lot of rules. But it's working. It's working. And what happens was, when I said that, that's called an affirmation. I'm really, math is so very easy to me. The brain locks onto that, and those messages just became a part of the way I thought. Mm. To the point where, when I saw numbers, I said, "Oh boy, this is really fun to teach," and people Steve, loved it. There was, there was a crisis point, as you describe in your story, crisis point where the dean said, "You either learn math That's right. and teach it, or, lose or you your don't job. have a job." Yeah. At that yeah. point. You could have said, you could have fallen back and said, gee, I, I'm bad at math. I can't yeah. learn math. Yeah. I can't. I'll have yeah. to go get another job. I'll be a yeah. truck driver. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, or whatever. Let me share with you another story that's even more poignant than this. Back in 2008, the beginning of the Great Recession, when the whole Internet system just collapsed and all these jobs were lost, I was one of them. I lost my job as a teacher at a college. And I was devastated because I was 62 years old and nobody was hiring. And my wife was an elementary school principal and she wanted to retire because back then the California school systems were imploding and the principals were really getting the flag. And she already got cancer once because of the pressure that she was on. I was going to have to tell my wife, I just lost my job. I'm 62. Nobody's hiring you are going to have to continue to work. This is going to be really hard. I hope you don't cancer. So I was there home on a Friday because I came early after getting let go. Mary came home, walked up the stairs, sat opposite me, and she asked me what happened. And I told her. Here's what she said. She said, Steve, something wonderful is going to come out of this. What? I have no idea. But now you're teaching for yourself. Something wonderful is going to come out. And what happened was, over the next 12 years, I've literally spoken and taught all over the world. I've written four books. That never would have happened unless I had been fired. And Mary said, something wonderful is going to happen. It starts with a decision. Something great is going to come out of this. Mm. Is the glass half full or half empty? It's always half full. Good advice. Well, I think everybody can actually watch this again <laughs> and again. I know that yeah. I'm lucky. I get to watch it as many times as I want. Let me share else, with you. Uh, let me share with you another story that just illustrates everything I said in just one very, very short story. I ended up this guy who thought I was dumb in math. I ended up teaching math at the University of San Francisco, and a student came to my office after the first day of class, sat down. She was very shy. She said, "Mr. Campbell, I'm so glad you're my professor in math because I'm a C student in math." I said, "What do you mean, Sue?" She said, "I have never gotten above a C in a math test, so I'm a C student." 
And I said to her, well, you know what? So I used to be the same way. So let me work with her. So I did. And she got an A in the first midterm. I couldn't believe it. I gave her the test and she absolutely freaked out. She said, <gasps> and then she said, oh, Mr. Campbell, this is a mistake. What do you mean, Sue? I have never gotten above a C in a math test. You made a mistake when you graded this. This has got to be an F. And I said, it isn't, Sue. This is an A. I graded it myself. So then she looked at it longer. I'll never forget this. She looked at it longer, and she smiled. Her face just broke up, and she lit up, and she said, do you know what this means? I said, of course I do, Sue, but I want you to tell me. This means that when I flunk the next test, I can still maintain my C. <laughs> I said, Sue, just get an A on every test. And she said, quote, I can't, Mr. Campbell. I'm a C student. And that's exactly what happened. She flunked the next test, she got a C in the course. So I sat down with her. I said, Sue, answer me this. What would have happened if you had flunked this first test? Do you know what she said? You already know what she said. She said, easy. I would have studied like crazy to get an A on the next test. I'd have to to maintain my C. I said, Sue, just get an A in every test. She said, I can't. Why? Because I'm a C student. Now, dear listeners, listen to this. You may not say you're a C student, but you say, I've always been this way. This is the way I was raised. This is what I cannot do. This is where I get stuck. This is how I feel about myself. This is what I look like. This is where I'm limited. Or, 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 do you know when your old life ended? It ended one second ago. So if that's true, when did your new life begin? One second ago. Now do the math, 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day. In one 24-hour period, we, all of us, have 86,400 new opportunities for a new life every single day. All we have to do is take them. It's our choice. Wow. So That's exciting. So to tie it together, in a perfect world, the, the truth is, every second of every day of, of, of your entire life is a chance for perfection. Exactly. Exactly. To give yourself the next time, the next yeah. time, the next to, time. To, to choose to change. Yes. Yes. It's and your not choice. go back. Yeah. It's your choice. That's right. Excellent. Steve, excellent uh, Excellent advice. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.